Hi everyone, welcome back to our journal club and uh, tonight we are just waiting for Dr. Gandeep Sakan to join us and um, yeah, while we're waiting, oh, there she is, she's very prompt. Um, I uh, just uh, get started, I just wanted to say I am still, hi, hi, how are you? Doing well. Oh, good, good. Is, um, is the volume okay? Yeah, the volume is great. Okay, wonderful. Good, yeah. Um, I was just uh, saying before we get started, um, I was apologizing to everybody because I have been really behind in responding back to um, messages in the past week. Um, I have been like busy with a lot of other stuff at home and at night, and <laughs> I'm actually working. I have a grand rounds due this Friday. Um, oh, wow that I'm doing, yeah, for the Department of Neurology at my hospital. I'm doing it on um, gender bias in medicine. So if oh, anybody's wow. interested in the talk, uh, I'm oh, wow. available to give that talk. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, so I have been just a little bit busy, but I'm catching, I'll be catching up um, over the next week or so um, and responding back to everybody who wanted to contribute to the blog on our website. So um, with that, I wanted to introduce Dr. Sakan. Am I pronouncing that correctly? I haven't. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. What, what, how do you say it? <laughs> well, the colloquial pronunciation is Sekon, but, but okay. Sekon is fine. Yeah. Sekon. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so she has completed her residency at Georgetown um, University Hospital in Washington, D.C. She also completed a geriatric psychiatry fellowship at Stanford University Hospital and now works as a staff psychiatrist for the past five years in um, the California Correctional System. Um, she loves psychiatry. She loves the stories of patients and the fact that there's hope for rehabilitation. And she's been a part of Psychiatry Network for the past year. She uses it for sharing knowledge and um, information and socializing. So with that, um, why don't you tell us what article that you're doing and uh, take it away. All right, wonderful. So today we'll be talking about the neural substrates of antisocial personality disorder. And um, <clears throat> the article um, is basically divided in six sections. So at first we'll talk about some numbers, diagnoses, then differences in executive function, after that defensive reactivity, cognitive emotional processing, reward anticipation, and then finally treatment suggestions. Um, this was published in the fall of 2016. So um, starting, um, Basically, they give a very precise number in terms of the antisocial personality disorder prevalence. It's 4.3%. Um, before that, they talk about 50 million um, U.S. adults have met criteria for antisocial behavior, um, not necessarily the personality disorder. However, there is a description of adulthood antisocial behavioral syndrome, which means that you meet criteria for ASPD, which is not as severe. However, you were not diagnosed with the conduct disorder at 15 um, and there are numbers about the prevalence there as well. Um, I would like to take us to the figure one uh, where they talk about comorbidities. And I think this is important because the highest comorbidity is um, in substance use disorder. It is 70%. This was a 12 month prevalence um, that they talk about. Um, after that comes the AABS, the adulthood antisocial behavioral syndrome, and then um, the non-antisocial numbers. The lowest number there was um, that of bipolar one disorder, around 11%. Um, and there is um, comorbidity with less skilled employment as well as financial dependency as well. Um, they talk about the conversion of conduct disorder to ASPD, 25% in girls and 40% um, in the boys. Um, after that, there's talk about the ASPD diagnoses, which were changed from um, DSM-4 to DSM-5. DSM-5 talks about personality dysfunction and pathological personality traits, which is a little different from the straightforward criteria that were um, given in DSM-4. Um, and there is a higher prevalence in AS ASPD um, as well as AABS in males versus females. Um, there has been a lot of debate about antisocial personality disorder versus psychopathy. Is it the same term? Is it different? Um, psychopathy has not been included in DSM ever since uh, the publication of DSM-3. That was 1980. Um, however, IS ICD does recognize it under the dissocial um, personality disorder. And 
this article will um, go in two dimensions, and I think um, that's important for us to know. The antisocial um, dimension and um, antisocial lifestyle dimension, which includes impulsivity, responsibility, sensation seeking, and the affective interpersonal dimension, which is callous, unemotional, manipulative, superficial charm, grandiose, blah, blah, blah. So I want um, us to remember the RA term, which is reactive aggression, which is more in tune with antisocial lifestyle, and then CU, which is callous, unemotional, which is more of the affective interpersonal dimension. After that, the article goes into um, the differences of executive function deficits. Um, there was a meta-analysis of multiple studies. I think the total amount of candidates was, in, you know, when they put together all the studies, 12,000 plus. Um, varied, you know, population. There were um, incarcerated folks, community folks, um, all kinds. And they were able to demonstrate a definite executive deficit. Um, However, it was not homogeneous, you know, with different um, functions that were um, demonstrated that there was a difference in. Um, and one of the weaknesses of the study was that they, there was not enough knowledge about the substance use um, and other stuff, the comorbid stuff. So even though we had a definite number in terms of executive function, we didn't know how the comorbidities um, were functioning there. After that, the article um, goes into talking about um, a study between offenders with ASPD with multiple levels of psychopathy, and they have the cognitive um, um, Cambridge cognitive tests there, and they were able to demonstrate that the several tasks, if you had ASPD, you did not perform as well. Um, one of the differences, however, was that um, ASPD Cambridge gambling, your quality of decision making in the gambling task was not as good um, as the healthy uh, controls. However, the risk taking was very similar. So I thought that was an interesting difference. Um, after that, we talk about the set shifting task, um, you know, the Wisconsin card sorting task that we are familiar with, and the computerized version. And it was shown that in these groups, although the learning was intact, but set shifting was not. Um, set shifting was impaired in ASPD groups. It didn't matter what your level of psychopathy was. Um, if you had ASPD, you did not have um, a good score in set shifting. However, there was another study which sort of refuted that, um, so that was interesting. After that, the article talks about a multiple regression analysis, um, and, and basically the underlying message is that if you have a, a high scores in the psychopathy dimension, you have a greater cognitive flexibility in terms of executive functioning. Um, another study that was done in ASPD without substance use disorders, and I thought that was interesting uh, because this was without substance use. Um, there were no differences in set shifting, executive planning, or working memory. However, um, if you had ASPD, you were impaired on your response inhibition and risk adjustment. Um, so basically, you were a little impulsive, I guess. And um, after that, there is talk about... Um, distress tolerance, the next study. And the way the distress tolerance was measured was through these tasks uh, on the computer. And it was shown that there is higher, if you had higher psychopathy scores, you were associated um, with a greater distress tolerance. Your, your performance um, was better in, in these um, tests. Shiam, do you, see, do you have that static? I'm hearing a little static. Uh, a little bit, but I think it's okay. okay. All right. Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, it's just here and there. It's okay. Okay, wonderful. All right. So, um, so basically the message here is that um, there is increased cognitive flexibility um, if you are high on the psychopathy and um, increased distress tolerance as well. All right. And then the article um, talks about the differences in defensive reactivity. And the way um, the defensive reactivity uh, was measured was a startle reflex. And they do want to differentiate that this is not the fear reactivity that they're talking about. This is more of how the brain is responding to a stimulus. Um, and one of the measurements was the eye blink reflex. And um, there was either a potentiation or an inhibition of this eye blinking. Um, if you were given pictures pleasant pictures or unpleasant pictures to look at the way you responded. So if you were looking at unpleasant pictures, 
you would respond um, strongly. Your eye blink would be stronger versus um, if you were looking at pleasant pictures, you were not as startled, I guess. Um, however, if you were scoring high on the psychopathy uh, dimension, you had startle um, you inhibition, which was opposite. So basically saying that there is almost a deficit in aversive reactivity. Um, so you're not rep responding as strongly to the aversive um, stimuli. Another study that demonstrated this, um, and this is our figure two, um, where they had the averaged evoke response potentials. This was measured by the P300 uh, response. Basically, it's a positive deflection on an EEG. Um, a certain stimulus is given, and then we um, measure this P300 response after 300 to 500 microseconds and see what that quest or trough looks like. If you look at the figure, um, if you're looking at pleasant or unpleasant stimuli, for, uh, which means if your brain is busy with some cognitive processing, the amplitude, and this is the crest of the wave, the orange and the blue, is a little lower than when you're looking at a neutral picture, when it means your brain is not busy processing any emotional um, stuff. However, if you look at the um, box on the left in the figure, um, if you're a psychopath, um, the amplitude is lower. Hence, it, it almost seems like you know, your, your brain does not really get busy in anything. So this goes to talk about diminished defensive responding um, when, when that stimulus is sounded. After that, um, the study talks, there is um, an fMRI study, um, which was very interesting. This is an ultimatum game that they studied with social fairness. Basically, there is a proposer and there is a responder. The proposer is given 20 bucks and they're asked to divide these $20 between the responder and themselves. It's an open division. Everybody knows what, what's going on. And the responder can accept it or reject it. If they accept it, you know, both of them get the uh, divided money, whatever the division was. If they reject it, nobody gets the money. However, this study was very interesting. They added another um, aspect. They um, added the retaliation. If the responder was not happy with the division, the division, they could actually punish the proposer by spending, this was $20 in total, they could spend one, two, or three dollars. So this study basically showed that um, this was done in youths with disruptive behavior disorder. This showed that if you were low on callous, unemotional traits, so basically low on the psychopathy, you had greater activation in your amygdala and periacroductal gray and lower activation in your ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and this was the opposite if you had high if you, scores on your um, callous, unemotional um, aspects. Um, however, they were also able to demonstrate, and this is the retaliation part, this being able to punish. And this was not just the actual um, threat that was perceived, but um, also the perceived threat, for example, if they felt that this was not a fair division. Um, the propensity to retaliate correlated with reactive aggressive symptoms, which is more on our antisocial dimension, lower activation of intramedial prefrontal cortex, and no connection or reduced connectivity between ventromedial prefrontal cortex and amygdala. So basically, this went on to, you know, we're seeing a trend here. There is less defensive reactivity if you are um, less defensive reactivity if you're high on the um, interpersonal affective dimension. So if you're more of a psychopath and less of an antisocial. After that, um, the article gets into the cognitive um, emotional processing. Um, this was quite interesting because it's, you know, this will take us to figure three later, but this, basically they're talking about empathic resonance here. And we can um, go to figure three straightforward and maybe come back later. Figure three talks about the empathic resonance where um, the anterior insula, the infer um, inferior frontal gyrus, and middle and anterior cingulate cortex are in play. And they were able to show that um, the activation of the empathy was decreased in folks who had more of an affective interpersonal um, dimension versus the an lifestyle antisocial. So there is an inverse correlation, and you can see that in the figure. And um, the bright parts are the empathic resonance um, areas in the brain. Um, also, they were able to show in young kids, and this is going back to the article, that if kids were shown pictures um, with 
uh, let's see, what was that? Uh, fearful faces. If you were high on the CU traits, more on the psychopathy, your amygdala was not getting as activated. And um, an activation of amygdala, and this was also um, shown in the adult community sample as well. So basically, you know, there's almost this opposite brain function in terms of empathic res resonance that we can actually um, see. And this figure three, basically the way they were able to demonstrate empathy was they were showing these candidates um, pictures of folks who were being hurt. And this pain was either being elicited by hurting an extremity and the subjects were responding to that pain. After that, we come to our reward anticipation. Um, the antisocial lifestyle dimension has a clear association with the increased reward anticipation. So you, you tend to be a little more impulsive, you're anticipating a little more in whatever you're go, um, going to do. And that was demonstrated um, in the ventral striatum. And um, also there was, um, later they talk about the two groups that were studied, uh, offenders and healthy individuals. And um, they suggested an normally strong reward signaling signaling and impulsive antisocial individuals who engaged in um, criminal behaviors versus who do not. So basically the same thing. The ventral striatum was talking more strongly to the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. Um, after that, we talk about the treatments. Um, and this was very interesting. I think more, you know, there have been more studies done in children um, with, in terms of treatment and there was a big um, analyses, the Bayesian meta-analysis, and this study was published by AHRQ. And we can go to the website if someone's interested. It's effective care, AHRQ slash uh, disruptive behavioral disorders. And um, they st this uh, article said 66 studies, but when you actually go to their website, I think it's 84 studies. And this was done from 1994 to 2004. Um, they were able to elicit that the psychosocial interventions, if a parent is involved, um, it is much more effective than um, when a parent is not involved. And they had divided the kids into three categories, preschool, school going, and adolescent. Um, and this was replicated in another study. However, they, um, another study showed that if we divided kids in terms of antisocial behaviors, which were recommended for treatment, those kids showed a more positive response versus the kids um, who just were screened and met criteria for antisocial behavior. Those kids did not show as much of a positive response. Um, another meta-analysis showed that uh, parent-directed training was more effective for younger kids. However, for adolescents, CBT was more effective. Um, the British National Institute of Health and Clinical Evidence, NICE, um, Similar recommendations they talk about involving parents and teaching problem solving techniques so that there is strengthening of adaptive skills and strategies amongst the kids. Um, in, when it comes to adults, um, we don't have such good um, reviews. The Cochrane Review could not come up with anything concrete when it came to the antisocial or um, affective interpersonal aspects. They did have a study, um, Impulsive Lifestyle Counseling Program, um, didn't help much with ASPD. However, they did see um, a decrease in attrition when it, come, uh, when it came to substance use treatment. So if there's, I'm, I'm hoping there's 70% comorbidity. So something was treated there. Um, the NICE uh, recommendations talk about engaging adults with um, ASPD and making, uh, building a therapeutic response specifically built upon um, hope, optimism, and positivity. And um, let's see, after that, we come to our pharmacological interventions. Um, when it came to kids, there were um, some positive short-term um, outcomes with two antipsychotic medications. Um, one was risperidone and the um, second was quetiapine and, um, and stimulants in, in some very small studies. However, um, when it came to adults, there is one study with clozapine. Um, they studied the uh, seven inpatient offenders. These, were in a, these um, offenders were in a high security hospital, but they were able to demonstrate that not only the aggressive behaviors went down, but also the um, psychiatric symptoms. 
Um, however, there are studies more recently published that emphasize that we need to differentiate aggression if this was impulsive aggression versus premeditated, uh, premeditated aggression. There is response showing that if it is impulsive aggression, medications seem to do better. However, if it is premeditated, um, the medications do not have much of an effect. And um, that is pretty much it. So going back, ASPD 4.3%. 1% psychopathy, executive functioning, definite deficits, increased cognitive flexibility if you are more on the psychopathic side, increased distress tolerance if you're more on the psychopathic side. Um, the brain reacts more defensively if you're more on the antisocial dimension. There is a definite deficit in aversive uh, response when it comes to the psychopathic side and um, high reward anticipation when it comes to the antisocial um, side. And in terms of medications, um, one study in clozapine, antipsychotics, and some stimulants in kids, and then the therapy should involve a parent. So, yep, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you uh, for that great summary. Um, what did you think of this article? I mean, considering the work that you're doing in the I thought this facilities. was, it was um, very topical for my work. And now I can actually, you know, talk about when, especially when it comes to pa patient education, Mm -hmm. um, the fact that this article said that not all ASPD folks have the psychopathy, that, that it's 1% and it, this includes mm -hmm. all samples, not just offenders, um, that plays a big role. And then, you know, what I found very interesting was the ultimatum game, because that talk, talked about retaliation when it came to perceived threat. Mm -hmm. And um, given my work, sometimes, I mean, now I understand it so much better that, you know, sometimes it's just the perception that, you know, the patient will be discharged back to a prison that they don't want to go to, mm -hmm. or they are having some safety issues on the yard. So I thought this was an amazing article. So, okay, yeah. well, good. Um, yeah. Very good. Yeah, it may not be quite, you know, as relevant <laughs> for everybody, but we do all yeah. come across um, this diagnosis in our work. I mean, I know I do um, here and there. Yeah. So, I mean, 1% they say is not a lot for psychopathy, but I think it is a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's the same, um, you know, that's the same frequency as we see schizophrenia, which I feel like is, you know, a good amount. So I don't know. Well, well, when it comes to the diagnosis of psychopathy, it's only been studied in the incarcerated populations, really. Mm -hmm. And it's Dr. Hare, he's a Canadian psychiatrist, um, mm. or a psychologist, I believe, who came up with this list. Okay. Um, so I wonder if, you know, um, but there is more and more talk about, you know, how psychopaths go up the corporate rungs or become mm -hmm. police leaders. So, so yeah. I think that... So they're all yeah. among us, maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For sure. For okay. sure. Well, thank you. I don't think we have any questions. Um, if right. people have questions, you're always welcome to um, just post it as a comment later and we'll try to get back to you. Um, right. But otherwise, we will see you on Wednesday when we are discussing um, uh, in, uh, intermittent explosive, intermittent explosive disorder. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll see you guys then. Take care. Thank you. All right. Good night. Okay. Bye.